Festival of Women Authors 2021 online. Hello, I'm Nora Morley, the chair of the festival. I'd like to thank our committee of volunteers who have worked so hard to bring you our fabulous 2021 authors in video presentations like this one. A unique aspect of our festival is that our authors share their journey as a writer and as a woman. In addition to providing a platform for women authors, we make grants to literary programs. Our recent program grants were made to Pasadena City College, Writer in Residence, Visiting Writer and Summer Writing Academy. Pasadena Public Library, One City, One Story. Pasadena Senior Center, Masters in Learning. Penn America Emerging Voices Fellowship and the Right Girl Mentoring Program. To all of our donors, thank you for your generous support and a special thank you to our community sponsors, starting with our lead sponsor, Clifford Swan Investment Counselors, where investment counseling is so much more than finances, it's providing wisdom for generations. And our publisher level sponsors, BNY Mellon Wealth Management, and Payton Regal Investment Management. And our sponsors at the editor level and at the novel level. We are so happy that we've been able to bring our 2020 and 2021 authors to you with our online festivals. We look forward to seeing you in person on March 19th, 2022 at the Pasadena Convention Center with more fantastic women authors. And now, Enjoy this author's story. Hi, I'm Judy Wilson, a member of the Author Selection Committee. When you dip into a debut novel, you never know what you're going to find. Pam Zhang's book, How Much of These Hills is Gold, is both a surprise and a delight. Set in the days of the California gold rush with elements of magical realism, she has reimagined a wild, wild west that includes roaming tigers in the saga of two Chinese orphans. National Public Radio's review stated, Zhang's style can be densely, airlessly lovely. Self-conscious lyricism fills the page like all of that California dust, sometimes making it hard to breathe. The book opens with a death and a body that requires a burial. From the first sentence, when 12-year-old Lucy and 11-year-old Sam find their father dead in his bed, the novel speaks to us about loss, grief, and the importance of ritual. Their recently departed mother had told them the rules for burying the dead, placing silver dollars on the eyes of the dead person, weighing down his spirit. Their father was a failed prospector. Thus, the panelist orphans go on a quest to find the silver dollars to properly bury him. Pam Zhang was born in Beijing and educated at Brown University and the University of Cambridge. She makes her home in Washington State. Her debut novel has been widely praised. It made the Booker Prize long list. It was also a finalist for the Center of Fiction's first novel prize. It was one of NPR's best books of the year, and it was one of Barack Obama's favorite books of 2020. I am so pleased to introduce Pam Zhang. Thank you, Judy, so much for that kind introduction. And thank you so much to this entire festival and our audience. I am really excited to speak with all of you today. Well, we're very pleased to have you and we can hardly wait to hear about your journey as a writer. Take it away, Pam. Because we've all been trapped inside for so long and away from the normal rhythms of our lives, I thought I would talk a little bit about how my book actually owes a great debt to a period in which I did nothing. So a few years ago, a friend I'd known only as a writer posted a picture of freshly baked loaves of bread. The bread was beautiful and golden and triumphant, yet this writer declared the bread the physical manifestation of their shame. The bread was procrastination from their book project. The bread was self-flagellation. And the comments section of this picture of the bread had become a sort of modern confessional, dank and musty with self-doubt, though the bread should have been only delicious. 
I was, at the time, mired in a project of my own that had gone off the rails, and the bread inspired deep feelings of inadequacy. So I typed a joke. Bread is writing, I said, with double exclamation points. I'd make variations of this joke over the next few years. Netflix is writing, or cocktails are writing, or photos of my cat are writing. <laughs> And eventually the exclamation points and the irony fell away. Flowers are writing, baths are writing, doing nothing at all is writing. I say this because in 2015, just before I began writing How Much of These Hills is Gold, I found myself in the sudden and quite terrifying position of having a whole lot of nothing on my hands. I had just moved to Bangkok, Thailand, a city I had never before visited and in which I had a single friend. So picture me, if you will, stepping off the plane on this hot autumn day, 13 degrees north of the equator. I can smell exhaust and fried foods and damp stone from the monsoons. I'm disoriented by the sun and the heat and the slow pace at which the locals meander down the sidewalk by my leap across so many time zones. And for the first time in my adult life, I'm not quite sure what happens next. You see, I had always been very strict with myself. When I moved to Thailand, I have just been laid off from my job at a tech startup in San Francisco. This was a job that I started four years earlier as a copywriter, making very little in one of the most expensive cities in the world. I started this job immediately after my graduation. I started it with an unpleasant shock on my first day that most people in the office had been told my title was intern and I would have to prove myself to keep this job. I started this job because I needed money and my family could offer me none, and I was terrified of being kicked to the streets. And so the moment I left the institution of my university, I clung to the institution of the workplace. I put in 60 and 70 hour weeks, first putting the extra time in on weekends, and then after getting a tip from a coworker, doing it on weekday nights so that I could visibly walk past the C-suite's desk when I left at eight or nine. PM. And for the flavor, you know, I ate free prosciutto and salmon in the office kitchen. I got a raise. And for the first time in my life, I had money for nice clothes and for vacations and for taking my family to dinner. But most of all, what I found most valuable from my career was that it gave me the assurance of a narrative in my life. I knew how much I could expect in my next paycheck, and I knew how much more I could expect as I was promoted. I had in my career a guide to how life was meant to go, meaning onwards and upwards, a solid version of the American dream I'd heard all my life. And in this version, there was less and less room for my love of writing. Reading remained a solace. But the act of writing didn't quite fit into this narrative. Where was the plan and where was the security? So this is where I was when, at the age of 22, something happened to disrupt this narrative. My father died. So when I was a small child, my father shared with me one of the few stories I have of him as a small child. This was at a time when I wanted a dog very badly. We lived on my mother's graduate student stipend and paid for our groceries using food stamps, which I didn't recognize as food stamps. Despite having read books about impoverished families because the currency looked nothing like a stamp. For a long time, I didn't realize that we were poor. I didn't see my family under that label, just as I didn't see my family as betrayed by the American narrative of equal opportunity for all. But anyways, here's the story my father told. As a child, my father had a fluffy white dog. One winter, when his family was especially hungry, they killed and ate the small white dog to fend off starvation. 
As I remember it, there was no particular inflection to my father's voice and no shading of this story as horror or as tragedy. He was matter of fact. Maybe he was trying to say that he understood me. And we never spoke of the dog again. What I'm trying to say is that the narrative my family handed to me is a history made of Swiss cheese. It's a narrative of intimations, of lone and exasperating and uneasy details, and these wide chasms of obscurity and opacity. In other words, it is a quintessential immigrant family narrative, particularly because my parents grew up in China during the Cultural Revolution. And so they left me these bits of story. For example, once my uncle was stranded for two days in the jungle with a truck full of young boys who'd hired themselves out for manual labor. The moral of the story is that my uncle learned to quit being a picky eater. How exactly he got into the jungle, what happened afterward, and whether he was paid for his labor, unclear. Another story. My mother was at Tiananmen in 1989. The moral of this story, according to her, is that young people get swept up in ideas. How my mother felt about the mass bloodshed at the square, what political slogans she chanted or did not chant, unclear. Another story. Once, my family moved from Kentucky to California, leaving my father behind for a year. The moral of this story is still unclear to me why we moved, what forces drove my mother, what stories of debt and addiction and harassment and exploitation I have pried from my mother only as an adult and only in bits and pieces, never as a truly coherent narrative. The writer Elaine Castillo speaks of lacunae in immigrant histories. These are the blank spaces that have as much power in the telling as the words themselves. These gaps in my life's narrative have shaped and in many ways become the narrative itself, a nothingness that is the opposite of empty. I wrote fiction all throughout my childhood, but it wasn't until I was an undergraduate that I encountered the lyric essay. If you're not familiar with the lyric essay, it's a form that often elides chronology or direct logic or anything that can be pinpointed as a thesis or an argument. The lyric essay is a form without a conventional form. It's cut and layered, it suggests and evokes. You put a description of a bird beside a page break, beside a description of your unmarried aunt's dress, and suddenly, in the space between these disparate elements, there is a form of narrative that derives its power from looking at things askew and through the gaps. In my four years of studying the lyric essay, I learned that there is no objective truth, that we are all capable of collaging our pasts, of interspersing facts and figures and reassembling them to form story. Lyric essays turn fact and fiction on their heads. And by the way, if you want a good entry into lyric essays, I recommend Woven by Lydia Yuknevich and Joyas Volardoras by Brian Doyle. At the same time that I was writing these lyric essays, I was lucky enough to be at a liberal arts university and immersed in classes with a strong anti-colonialist bent. My political education reiterated what I learned in the writing classroom, that what I'd been taught was objective truth, was not so objective after all, that it is always a question of who is telling the story and why and what is left out. This discovery was world-shaking within the world of my expensive university where for four years on a scholarship, I was repeatedly assured that intellectual exploration was the greatest goal. But then at the end of those four years, I had to go back to the real world. I had to get a real job. Which brings me back to my father's death. 
I took a single week off work, not explaining the circumstances. I read countless articles about the five or seven or 10 or whatever stages of grief. And I tried to write nonfiction about my father. These obsessions slunk from the same lizard part of my brain that tried to find shelter under the illusion of structure that scuttled after anything resembling forward momentum. I wanted the reassurance that grief too had a narrative I could follow, that I could get through it with sufficient steps and sufficient planning. So I paid the funeral parlor and picked up the ashes. I returned to work. I signed up for a ceramics class. I moved in with my boyfriend. I scheduled dinners and took vacations. From the outside, I was on my same upwardly mobile track. But also you have to look at the blank spaces, the lacunae. In my off hours, I returned to reading fiction with a hunger. I wrote a few ragged short stories for the first time in many years. I sat with my grief. And when I was laid off a few years later from the job I'd begun to do with increasing apathy, I took my severance as an opportunity. I moved to Bangkok and for the first time in my life, I left the track that led to an assured upper middle class existence. In Bangkok, I first occupied myself with taking uh, tests and applying to MFA programs in fiction, but after just a few weeks, I was done with these tasks and I found myself adrift. I had no certainty of being accepted into these programs with their sub 5% acceptance rates. I was lonely. In my many endless blank hours, I thought not very coherently about what it felt like to live for the first time as an adult in a majority Asian metropolis where my Chinese face was now unremarkable. I thought about the cogs and gears of capitalism and the sexism I'd experienced in the workplace. I thought about California burning in one of its many drought years from afar. And then one day, months later, without planning it, I woke up with an image in my head. Golden hills, searing heat, of the death of a father and two children on the run. I believe this to be a short story, and I wrote it as I have always written my short stories, quickly. Then I put the completed story aside. But the characters wouldn't leave my mind. They haunted me. At the time, I really didn't want to write a novel. I didn't want to take up a project so big without an institution to guide me to its completion. And yet, six months later, I acceded to the persistence of these two characters banging around in my head, and I wrote the first draft of How Much of These Hills is Gold. Nowadays, I say that my novel is haunted. I will say that I chafe at the idea that my fiction is autobiographical in the literal sense, and I chafe all the more because that label is disproportionately put to women writers and writers of color, as if we haven't the imagination. But isn't all fiction autobiographical in that it pulls from the emotional currents of real life? In my case, the book is haunted by grief and loss and displacement and curiosity about where I belong in the world. It's haunted by the gender and power dynamics I observed in my workplace. It is haunted by questions of where money comes from, who it flows to. It's haunted by every one of my obsessions over the previous few years. The false dream of the false promise of the American dream in a country where not everyone is treated equally. The dubious nature of a national mythology. My troubled relationship with the landscape of California. And the structure of the book is non-chronological. It's fragmented as my family history is fragmented. The language is bold and it sings and it is sprinkled with the cowboy poetry and the pigeon Mandarin I absorbed as a Chinese American girl growing up in the American West. From this side of publication, it is easy to label my book as a historical novel or an immigrant story. But I as I was writing, my novel felt like none of those things. 
what I'm trying to say is that I did not choose the project so much as the project chose me, and that often a book is a collage of everyone you have been and everything on your mind. Even if the narrative of your life is unclear to you as it is unfolding, you may later find that what looked like doing nothing turns out to be quite the opposite. It's a shame that when we say writing, we mean only the act of putting words to the page. How dull, how short-sighted. I want you to imagine this. It is two years ago, and we are still hugging our friends, still swaying in mass from subways, still stopping for happy hours at outdoor cafes where we lick food from our fingers and laugh in each other's faces and never disinfect our hands. On the evening of a day such as this one, I write an email to a writer friend. I ask about her lover, her job, her health. We haven't corresponded in months. And so as I write, there is a sense of stiff muscles warming. Only at the very end, when I feel sufficiently tender, do I say, I hope the writing is going well. To an outsider, the statement might sound cold. Writers know it as anything but. When I say, I hope the writing is going well, I am saying, I hope you are able to access the truest part of yourself. I am saying, I hope you feel thrillingly alive to possibility. I am saying, I hope you feel human. We come to the page when, turning back to face the mountains of our lives, we are far enough that we can finally discern the whole shape that was ungraspable from the peak. Then it's possible to rest, to breathe, to take out the pen and paper which were always available to us. There is all the time in the world after. Until then, if you are living through an uncertain stage like today, you are allowed to be tired, to be foot sore and heart sick. You are allowed to lay aside the tasks and focus only on survival. When I say I hope the writing is going well, I mean walking is writing, crying is writing, working a minimum wage job to pay the rent is writing, talking to a parent whose health you fear for is writing, cooking is writing, Lying on the rug and watching sun stripe the wall is writing. Your lover's hand on yours is writing. Your dog is writing. I have had years in which I could not see the shape of my life or string together a good sentence. And I, I have had a summer in which, three years late, the fog lifted in a different climate halfway across the world and suddenly I could write. I want to trust in the fact that the words will come like old friends. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles. If you're grieving and lost and uncertain in this time, then I give you, writers, but also you, all of you, permission to dwell in the power of nothingness, which is to say, to live. Wow, Pam, I can say this. I think that speaking is writing and listening is writing. And thank you for sharing in such a candid and honest fashion. Uh, a wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, I will also say being in community with all of you here today for however minutes we have is also writing. And it is, it is again, like a real privilege to be in this small, and I will say despite the digital nature of it all, this group that feels really cozy and intimate. So thank you all for listening. I would agree with you. It doesn't seem virtual. It seems like we really connected with you and you connected with us. And I expect that we have a lot of questions for you. Uh, are you ready to take a little Q&A? Oh, of course. Good. Well, let's begin then. Hi. Uh, thank you, Pam, for, for sharing your novel with us. Uh, my name is T Dr. Tuk Tuk Tantraj, and I'm the interim dean of the English division at Pasadena City College. Uh, the English division at PCC is so fortunate to have the support, uh, many years of support from uh, the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors uh, that's funded our writer in residence program, as well as a very robust creative uh, writer series. Um, so um, I have a question for you, um, particularly as someone who also uh, 
specializes in Asian American literature. So your novel is so amazing to me. Um, the question I have is, did you conduct a lot of research into the role of the Chinese in the West in order to write the novel? Uh, hi, um, so lovely to, to meet you digitally. And I, I always love talking to teachers. Teachers and professors of literature are, are some of my favorite people. Um, to your question, I did end up doing research for this novel, but the way I thought about the role of research in a, in a book of fiction was in stages. So, you know, as I said in my talk, the first, the first draft of the book sort of came out of me organically, it erupted out of my life. Well, you know, it's true that in my life, having gone through the California public school system, I did learn some sort of preliminary foundational facts about the presence of Chinese immigrants and laborers during the California gold rush. So, so I had that to draw upon, but mm -hmm. much in the same way that, um, I thought it was important in creating this landscape that was inspired by the West and by California, but not, you know, represent it completely faithfully. I, I've likened the creation of that landscape to, you know, creating an impressionist painting, not like a photorealistic photograph. And in that same way, that's, that's how I wanted to play with the history of Chinese immigrants in that area. So after the first draft, when I had kind of like the emotional arc of the book, I did go back and sort of double check, check my facts and like line up dates, um, in the real world with sort of events in my book. For example, there is, um, uh, an event later in the book that has to do with the completion of the transcontinental railroad. And that was a fact that like sort of like rang through um, the real historical record as, as well. But I also took liberties because um, I, I think that I, I know, I know, you know, this as a professor that, you know, the, the lac lacunae that I spoke of, there are lots of them in history, particularly in Western history that, um, either deliberately or unintentionally misses the, the, the stories of, you know, of women, of people of color, of poor people, of disabled people, of queer folk. And so it was important to me in writing this novel that I wanted to reimagine this world, not to be limited by only the sort of facts that have been filtered down to us by the people in power. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, when you said that, I was thinking about how, in a way, your novel kind of rewrites history or fills in gaps uh, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't necessarily get from, you know, historical documentation or, or history books. Hi, Pam. I'm Arielle, and I'm a Riker alum and a current UCLA pre-political science student. Uh, and I was really interested in how you in your version of the Wild West, you used tigers instead of mountain lions. So I wanted to know what compelled you to introduce a little bit of magical realism into your narrative. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ariel. Thank you for that question. I love I love talking about this. So um, I thought of tigers in a similar way that I thought about the pigeon Mandarin that is in the book and that the family speaks. Um, you know, I wanted the tigers to, they're not real, obviously, but I wanted them to sort of communicate the, the impression of another culture on this landscape. You know, I grew up with depictions of the Wild West that were incredibly white, incredibly male. And by this point, sort of, you know, all of us, if I say the Wild West, the same, I'm sure, like very similar stereotypical images pop up in our heads. But again, as, as we've just discussed, um, that isn't actually all the images of history. It's just like the select few that have been culled through. And so for me, putting tigers in there was a little bit of an act of defiance um, in the same way that putting these characters front and center of their own story in, in the Western was an act of defiance. That's sort of like we were here as well. I love that because it shows uh, history through a new perspective and a new lens, just like you're saying. So thank you for sharing. My name is Akilah Gibbs. I'm the executive director of the Pasadena Senior Center. And in your novel, Sam's gender presentation is a significant aspect of the story. And I'm curious, why did you decide to layer in that specific attribute? Yeah, thank you for that question, Akilah. Um, 
in a, in a way that wasn't a decision, right? I spoke about waking up with this novel in my mind and Sam and Lucy really arrived as a fully formed pair. Um, it was, they were always who they were. And I am one of those writers where I really let the character sort of drive the story. I let the character sort of decide in many ways what's going to happen next. I don't arrive with a sort of plan. Um, that said, you know, as I was sort of working through the character of Sam, I think that Sam's one, Sam, Sam's gender, um, presentation and Sam's, uh, identity as what I think we would today in 2020 call either trans or non-binary, right? Um, people like that existed. And so like, it was important to me again, to think about how we can get those people back into our, into some form of the historical record. And maybe nowadays, if those actual facts are lost, it can only be through, through modes of fiction, right? That was really important. And I also think that Sam and Lucy in combination, their characters have a lot to say about, um, gender dynamics and power in this deeply, uh, misogynistic, deeply patriarchal society. And, you know, um, this sort of notion of masculinity and toxic masculinity is, I think, endemic to the tradition of American Westerns. It is kind of what the cowboy, cowboy flick, the cowboy book are built on. So I really wanted to have Sam and Lucy and Ma to some extent play with that, to really question it and to look at this world in which male power and violence are dominant and to think, how do I rest a little bit of that power away? And um, you can see Sam being one of the canniest observers of gender dynamics and one of the canniest players, right? Sam is even more deeply aware of how like a surface change in presentation can drastically change the options you have available to you in this world. Well, I, I appreciate you honoring and introducing uh, the, the whole subject of transgender and binary. So thank you for doing that. Uh, my name is Lovely. I'm also a Right Girl alum, and now I'm a writer and a nuclear policy analyst. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say that your reflection really felt like an exhale. So thank you. Um, my question to you is about the concept of home, uh, which is central to your book. Uh, having lived, I think, in 14 cities across um, four different countries, um, how do you define the concept of home, um, perhaps maybe aligned to this idea of lacunae or um, what you said as a collage of memory or experience? It'd be great to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, lovely. Nice to um, get your question. Yeah, the question of home has been one that has evolved over the years as I've carried it with me. I think that, you know, as a very young child, um, a child of immigrants and a child of a family that just moved around a lot, we had lived in 10 different addresses by the time I went to college at age 17. Um, I was desperately looking for, I think I was looking for a kind of home in the sense that it would be a physical place where I would walk around and feel utterly one with the place. I would never feel, you know, exceptional in either a good or a bad way that it would feel like I was just attached to this place that I was in a way, um, as much a part of the landscape as like a tree or a house or a post office. And, you know, that just wasn't possible, um, being Chinese American in America. And, you know, actually when I, when I moved to Bangkok and worked on this book, that was interesting because in some senses it gave me what I wanted. Like for the first time, it wasn't noticeable. I wasn't like the only Asian person in a room. And so I, I became part of the landscape in that way. But then there, there were language barriers because I didn't speak Thai when I moved and there were the barriers of not having a shared culture. Right. So then some of the pieces of home fit and other pieces fell away. Um, and you know, nowadays I think I've just, come to find peace with the idea that maybe I'll never find that version of home I wanted as an eight-year-old. Um, but where I find home is in sort of like more localized places. Maybe I'll never be an entire country or even in an entire city, but I do feel at home with my, fr my friends in the sort of sp safe spaces we've built for each other. I find home in certain communities that I, um, that we were part of and like home really as cheesy as it sounds, it really is more about people 
right? I think than a physical place. And especially in this year in which we're all trapped indoors and the idea of like physical space is kind of imaginary anyways, um, it's given me some reassurance to be like, yeah, people are home and an idea can be home more than, you know, like a, a geographical dot on a map. That's amazing. I, I really identify with that as someone who travels a lot for work. Um, and this pandemic actually made me think about home as a physical space instead of an idea. But um, yeah, I think that that's, it's also true, um, being able to travel to places and realizing that, you know, to take um, the Americanness away and just be Asian for a change um, is also something that um, lands with me. So thank you so much for, for that answer. Hi, Pam. I'm Sandra. I'm a Wright Girl alumni and a current senior at Brown University. Uh, I wanted to thank you so much for such an amazing and inspiring talk and also just let you know that everyone over here is obsessed with your work. We, all my Asian American friends and I and a lot of my professors really love how much of these hills is gold. Uh, so just wanted to let you know you're a local celebrity over at your alma mater. And as for my question, um, seeing as How Much of These Hills is Gold was one of my favorite books of 2020, I was unsurprised to see it was on President Barack Obama's list of favorite books of 2020. Uh, what was your reaction to having that honor? What, what were some of your thoughts or do, how did you, mean, did you get to speak to him personally or um, just in general, what did you feel or react to the news? Um. Hi, Sandra. Thank you for your question. And also thank you for that little gift of news from Brown. That's just like a, a very special, um, but a very special compliment to get. Um, as for hearing about uh, Obama's list, it was funny because I think that after the first flurry of sort of book publicity, I felt, you know, as an introvert, I actually felt the need to withdraw a lot from the world so that I could sort of like, you know, actually fall into the nothingness I need to sort of inculcate the next project. And so I wasn't really on social media or online. And I think um, a friend sent me an email that actually started out with, I know Obama is a divisive political figure in many ways, but this is still pretty cool and, and a leak. So I found out in that sort of uh, funny way. Um, no, I have not spoken to Obama. <laughs> I don't think he has time for all the rest of us on his major book tour this year, but it's a huge honor. I think it's just an, a, an amazing thing because, you know, so much of the novel for me was commentary on Americanness and our national mythology and what we say to each other and to our children about um, what it's like to live here and what sort of future opportunities there are. And so it was very special to have, you know, someone who was one of the most, well, probably the, the most powerful figure in American politics who sort of like had his hand on, on the pulse of policy that affects these, um, these ideas of the American dream to read the book. Thank you so much. And I totally uh, get what you mean about needing to retreat away from society a little bit in order to be creative uh, in most shapes and forms. So thanks for uh, everything. <laughs> well, Pam, thank you so much. You can tell how enthusiastic uh, Elie, you've been received by your audience here. Um, I'm, I wish we could have done this um, in person Usually we have 750 people in our audience and we sell over 650 books. Oh, well, these are the times, but thank you for your efforts. And um, I'd also like to thank our guest Zoom audience. Uh, I wanna support the mission of festival and our two, 2021 authors by making a donation and purchasing the author's books. And that's very important by going to the PFWA website, which is listed at the end of this video presentation. It's been a pleasure to host this conversation. I hope to see all of you in person in the festival in 2022. Yeah, thank you again to Judy and the festival for everyone being here. I just hope you all have felt like, I feel like there's a warm energy in this digital room and it's been truly lovely to talk with all of you and receive your really thoughtful, incisive questions. And I, you know, I do have faith that one day there will be the opportunities for us to be together in a room to, in the future. So if you ever see me um, physically in the future, please, please come say hi. Thank you.